we're going to get started, everybody. Thank you for coming today. It's nice to see you all here. Um, we have the pleasure of um, hearing from Dr. Benjamin Fickman today. Um, I am going to just read a little bit uh, about him so he can be embarrassed by all of his accomplishments. Right? So, so um, Dr. Fickman earned his PhD in bioenergetics and was a postdoctoral fellow with the Duke National University of Singapore in Metabolic Disorders. Um, currently, his professional focus as a scientist and a professor, which is a professor um, at BYU, is to better understand chronic modern day diseases with a special emphasis on the origins and consequences of obesity and diabetes. He frequently publishes his research in peer-reviewed journals and presents at international science meetings. So we're very lucky to have him here to speak with us today. So I'll turn the time over to him. Guys, I'm thrilled at the invitation. One of the problems being a scientist is we get paid to ask questions and to find answers to those questions. But sometimes it's not particularly gratifying when the only person who hears the answers are other scientists. So the opportunity to actually share some of these answers to these important questions with people who actually have the ability to make a difference is very gratifying. I'm thrilled at the opportunity to present some of these things that we've found uh, and some of the questions that I've been asking over the past several years. So I hope you'll pardon the somewhat bold title here. I, what I hope to impress upon you is the fact that insulin resistance is not only remarkably prevalent, and we'll go over the details, but also particularly relevant in the context of virtually every chronic disease. I will give evidence to support some of that and would be thrilled to talk more about it at any other time you'd like. In fact, you'll have a hard time getting me to stop talking. By way of an introduction, let's sort of do a history lesson. I know it's odd for a uh, hard science professor to talk history. It's difficult, but I'll do it anyway. Um, something terrible happened in 1977. It was a wonderful day for Gary and Susie Bickman, or a wonderful year in southern Alberta, to bring another little red-headed boy into the, uh, onto the earth. But it was terrible for how we look at diet and disease. Um, this is when, for the first time in the history of the planet, so far as I know, a government decided to start telling people what to eat. And so this was the key aspect of what became the Food Guide Pyramid, particularly we need to eat more carbohydrates than we were, and we need to eat less fat than we have been eating. That was the general change. When this happened, what most people don't know is that there was a great deal of outcry. Among the most vocal opponents of these dietary change changes was the president of the National Academy of Sciences in the US, Dr. Philip Handler. His quote was, based on the fact that there was no significant data to support these dietary recommendations. So he was calling out the government and saying, what right do you have to conduct an experiment with the population as the study subjects? We need to do studies before you make these recommendations. And the politician, up for re-election, needed some sign of productivity. This was his literal exact quote, senators don't have the luxury that a research scientist does of waiting until every last shred of evidence is in. He wasn't waiting for every last shred of evidence. He wanted more evidence. But who won? Well, doc, uh, not the non-physician scientist won, the politician. And that began, this was the beginning of this significant departure from what had been very typical normal trends in the US to a significant increase in carbohydrate, a significant reduction in fat, and then no change in protein overall. This will become relevant in a little bit. So this was the wetting your appetite. I promise we'll come back to it. You might not care to. So why care about insulin resistance? Why devote my entire career to studying something that may seem as obscure as insulin resistance? The reality, it's not obscure at all. So just some general statistics. Within the US, 30% of the entire population is pre-diabetic, AKA insulin resistant. And when we look at just adults, half of all adults in the US are pre-diabetic. Again, that's synonymous with insulin resistant. This is the single most prevalent health disorder in the country, prediabetes or insulin resistance. It's not strictly within our own borders, or even Canada, where it's not quite as high, my beloved true north, uh, but it's close. However, when we go to other developing countries like China and India, 
The reason they wanted scientists like me in Singapore, where Duke Medical School has a new little branch of its medical school to study metabolic disorders, was they were mindful of the incredible increase in diabetes among the two <coughs> most predominant ethnicities in Singapore, the Chinese and the Indian and ethnicities in particular. So this problem is even worse. It's more than half of the adults in China, more than half of the adults in India are pre-diabetic. So you can see worldwide this is a problem that is unlikely to go away soon. And indeed, within all of our lifespan, very likely, insulin resistance is going to double. 30 years, we'll have a doubling of this. So you can see this will get far worse, likely, before it gets better. But maybe we can start making a change. So this is something that I don't want to take too much time on, just for the sake of time. But I often will show this just to help convey the idea that this is a far more prevalent problem than you think. If you were to kind of zip through this list, and you're answering some yeses and some noes, some of these you may think have nothing to do with insulin resistance. What does gout have to do with insulin resistance? Water retention, in fact, a great deal. And I'd be thrilled to talk about any of these with you in more detail. The most common source of female infertility, yes, that's fundamentally an insulin problem, increasing androgen production from the ovaries. So there's a lot to talk about. But the gist of it is, if you answer yes to two or more of these questions, you're fitting within that category of very likely being pre-diabetic or insulin resistant. Now, remarkably, almost all of these people, there's a range, depending on the publication you look at, it's about 50 to 90 percent of people with insulin resistance are undiagnosed. So I'm just using the more sobering number here. Um, but based on data, mind you, are un they're, so they're undiagnosed. They don't know. They're just going through their, life. they, their lives. Maybe they're diagnosed with hypertension. Maybe they're diagnosed with PCOS. And they have no idea that likely the fundamental feature, the fundamental source of the etiology is, in fact, insulin and insulin resistance. So if they're undiagnosed, how do they, how do they look? How are they acting? How is it manifesting? Well, it can manifest a, 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 with any of these. Heart disease is a manifestation of insulin resistance. Even certain cancers, as we'll talk about, things like stroke or osteoarthritis, which we look at now more as a metabolic problem and less of the physical wear and tear of the joint. We're learning much, much more about it. And other things like muscle wasting, migraines, who'd have thunk, are all related to insulin resistance. So in every instance here, insulin resistance is either a fundamental component or at least part of the etiology or exacerbating the course of the disease. And I would readily um, show you evidence to support that uh, if you'd like. Anytime. Have me back next time and we'll do it in more detail. So what is insulin resistance? What is this villain that I'm talking so much about and have devoted my whole career to better understanding? Insulin resistance, in short, can best be told by looking at the cell. So here is a cell. Every cell in the body has insulin receptors. Every single cell. I've never seen an exception, but I'm always looking. So when insulin binds to its receptor, there's a series of biochemical events that you've very all likely seen from biochemistry classes um, with, any, with any receptor. We have all these second messengers. So just to make things simple, insulin binds to its receptor, and then we have an action, whatever it may be. And there are hundreds or thousands of consequences of insulin binding its receptor. We typically look at only one, being that it will allow glucose to come in. If, it's, if this were a muscle cell or a fat cell, that would be true. But insulin does hundreds of other things. So insulin binds, we have an action. Over time, however, as a person's become insulin resistant, that same stimulus is incapable of producing the same level of action as before. So the same stimulus as before is yielding a diminished reaction or action. That's insulin resistance in its sort of cleanest sense. And so what can, this, what can the body do to try to increase that action? What do you think? Am I allowed to make this a little interactive? If one insulin molecule, let's just say, is insufficient, what does the body do? Yeah, well, the body will become hyperinsulinemic in order to promote, to return what was once, to get the action back to where it once was. So there are two key features of insulin resistance. One, some cells in the body are failing to respond fully to insulin. And it's not an all or nothing. You can have a cell like a liver cell, a hepatocyte, where some aspects of insulin's effects are compromised, and some are happily going on in their business per, um, per the norm. So one consequence, some cells aren't working well with regards to insulin. Another consequence is that the body's becoming more and more and more hyperinsulinemic. So blood levels of insulin are having to get higher and higher in order to overcome the cell's resistance to 
insulin. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But just to put it in the clinical context, if we had a patient come in, and we were, I'm just arbitrarily setting these at sort of so-called normal levels. They have so-called normal insulin, normal glucose, but in insulin resistance, they have to have more insulin in order to keep the same level of glucose in control. So higher insulin is allowing a normal glycemia, but the insulin's working harder to keep it there. All right, so what are the causes? This is something that we could spend a great number of hours on, and indeed was my whole postdoc, and even now we study this actively. Obesity is a cause of insulin resistance. Environmental mm -hmm. toxins, things like diesel exhaust, cigarette smoke, mm -hmm. and many, many other things that we can, in addition to inhaling, we can ingest. Like bisphenol A, BPA, you know, everybody has BPA-free water bottles nowadays, right? You know what I'm talking about? BPA has been shown to cause insulin resistance. So what these two have in common, and what is on its own a separate cause, is inflammation. So these are three key causes, undoubtedly important. Stress is another one, physical or emotional stress, as that increases cortisol, which is the key component of the stress response. Cortisol is a key insulin antagonist, so this is making us more insulin resistant. And then the elephant in the room, it doesn't seem like it would be as relevant as it is, but indeed the single most relevant variable is that insulin causes insulin resistance. Isn't that odd? If it seems odd at first, it won't be in a second. I submit to you that it's in fact a pretty logical series of events. And it'll make sense quite readily. So, increased insulin leads to insulin resistance. And this is a fundamental feature of this paradox of <coughs> insulin and insulin sensitivity are inversely related. So in a person who's living a lifestyle that is over time increasing their insulin chronically, insulin sensitivity over the same period of time is getting more and more diminished. So they're becoming more and more insulin resistant. This is a fundamental feature of biology. And why I said that if you actually think about it, it's pretty intuitive. If you're giving, a, con a cell is constantly exposed to, to a stimulus, it makes sense that we will become desensitized to that same stimulus, right? It's why we cycle antibiotics. We don't want the bacteria to become immune. So everything from bacteria to the most complex organisms, humans, if we can consider ourselves the most complex, every organism on the planet will have a decay in its sensitivity to a, con a chronic stimulus. The same thing's happening here. Too much insulin is causing insulin resistance. And I actually took out, I had a slide here, I modified it, and I took it out. But if, if I wanted to bring you into the lab and make you insulin resistant, all we would do is give you a steady infusion, a slightly hyperinsulinemic infusion of insulin. You'd be insulin resistant within about 48 to 96 hours. We would stop the insulin infusion and your insulin sensitivity would go right back to normal. So anyone can become insulin resistant if their insulin is too high for too long. And that'll become relevant when we start talking about what to do about it. <coughs> So why are so many people, I said 50 to 90% of people with insulin resistance are undiagnosed. Why is it? Because we look at it wrong. If you were to have someone come into the clinic, these are all very familiar numbers. Any clinician would look at these and you're, you could all nod your head and you could look at these cutoffs and within some very, very close range, these are going to be the clinical, the clinically acceptable cutoffs when you're looking at a patient and the risk of insulin resistance or diabetes as listed here. However, in the condition of insulin resistance, a.k.a. prediabetes, what's conspicuously absent? Insulin. We're not looking at insulin. So insulin has to be considered. We're looking, by not looking at insulin as a diagnostic for insulin resistance, we are missing the relevant variable. We're looking at all these other things. And sure, they're descriptive, but they're not the single most important variable. And so in this condition, to take it to an extreme, based on the widely used cl uh, clinical diagnostic points with regards to diabetes and insulin resistance. If you had a patient come in, the average blood test, let's say, here's a normal patient arbitrarily setting insulin glucose just at normal, although mind you, it's never even close to actually being even, just so that you know. I'm setting them both at normal. Someone comes into the clinic and they actually have higher than normal levels of insulin, but their glucose is normal. On most blood tests in most clinics, would this be clinically relevant? It wouldn't be, because we wouldn't have measured the insulin. The same thing could be said if the insulin were here. The same thing could be said if the insulin were even, max, whatever that would be. Simply because most blood tests and the average, when I go every year for my birthday to the BYU Health Center to get a blood test, insulin's not even, it's not even mentioned. There's no option of even getting it measured. It's only ever glucose. And that's unfortunate. 
this scenario can happen. Indeed, this is the scenario on some spectrum of insulin that typifies insulin resistance. This is frequent. Anyone with insulin resistance, this is what's happening. They have more insulin in their body, and that increased insulin is enough to keep all the other things in check. Now, all of a sudden, what happens when insulin is we cannot produce enough? We are so resistant to insulin that no amount of our own insulin from our own pancreas is enough to keep glucose in check. Then glucose starts to come up. Now, I have to ask, would this be clinically relevant? It is, because this is a diagnostic that we're very comfortable using. And we have very acceptable ranges for it. And it's just easy to test, much easier than insulin, which up until recently required radioactive approval. I mean, it was a very complicated assay. Glucose measurement, not complicated. So it's somewhat forgivable that we've ignored this other half of the equation, if you will. So the assumption with this diagnostic method is that glucose is the key variable. But I'll show you in just a moment that it is, in fact, insulin. So what I would humbly add to this, again, not being the clinician, being the person whose whole job is to just sit back and ask questions. And you can imagine we get paid accordingly. Um, so in this case, what I would add, you try to find clinical cutoffs for insulin, you'll find different numbers. Whereas with insulin, these are very widely accepted. With insulin, to the cleanest, most pure data that I can find, these are the best cutoffs I can come up with without any ulterior motives. This will seem low to some. However, what's relevant, just a, a couple years ago, a study from the Med School at the University of Arizona found that in women, the difference between having insulin at six microunits per mil versus eight microunits per mil, both of them below a typical number of around 10. So often you'll see 10 as sort of a normal number. But just going from six to eight, the women with eight microunits of mil um, at fasting of fasting insulin had a doubling of their risk of type 2 diabetes. So this is a relevant transition. Just saying under 10, I believe, is not descriptive enough. So I'm going with a little more rigorous numbers, again, based purely on data. So these numbers really fit better with what we're actually seeing in primary literature. Thus, to me, when someone's asking me about their blood numbers, I'm looking at their insulin and their risk of insulin resistance, or whether they are insulin resistant. And typically, six and below is going to be a great number. Now, just to prove that I'm not a heretic, that I'm not just making these things up, this was a study, a 25-year follow-up study. Down here, I've highlighted the development of type 2 diabetes is preceded by and predicted by defects in both insulin-dependent and insulin-independent glucose uptake. The defects are detectable when the patients are normal glycemic, and in most cases, more than a decade before the diagnosis of disease. So they're saying that 10 years before we actually detect a problem in glucose, they're manifesting problems with insulin resistance. Another study is indicating that the only marker of insulin resistance should be insulin, not glucose, because as I've already shown you, it's possible, and indeed often the case, that, that hyperinsulinemia is sufficient to keep the patient in normal glycemia, and thus often undetected. So measuring glucose is not enough. Insulin must be measured. Now let's get down to brass tacks. Let's, some, let's talk some specifics. So here are just kind of the biggest ones that I figured were worth bringing up. And among all this group, what we can find in each instance is that each of them is either or both, it's a consequence of too much insulin and or a consequence of insulin not acting well. In other words, insulin resistance. And so how can we lower insulin? If, this, if we had more time, I would talk about drugs and exercise as well. We don't. So we're just going to talk about diet. Because this is the one that I have the most to bring, although I have strong feelings about various drugs. We would be thrilled to talk about that more another time. Um, but with diet. This is where it gets a little controversial, only because someone wouldn't be familiar with the incredible data to support it. So the, there are four pillars, if you will, to cut it down to its simplest concepts. Someone who wants to mitigate their risk of insulin resistance, or indeed reverse the course, needs to do the following. Reducing sugar, reducing starch, I will put this in context, because that's of course a very broad class of nutrient increasing their dietary fat consumption, and engaging in intermittent fasting. Now let's go into each of these. So firstly with sugar, this is kind of an obvious villain, and it's not going to really um, upset anyone that I'm implicating sugar at, uh, in, a, in, a, in the context of 
causing insulin resistance, sugar will increase a person's insulin almost higher than anything. So we need to have it on our radar. What's important about it is that we actually, this is obvious, we need to determine how much the patient or we, would, how much we would be eating, but we also need to recognize it in all of its many, many sources because it is remarkably prevalent. <coughs> try to find a peanut butter without sugar, you can. Try to find a ketchup, try to find mayonnaise, try to find salad dressing or bread. Whatever else we want to go through, it is not easy. Sugar has pervaded our food system. You have to try, and you can, and I submit it's worth it, to find products that don't have sugar. We don't, who wants sugar in their ketchup anyway? I don't want it. We, want, we, get, we like the ketchup because it's a little tart. We don't want it sweet, but it's everywhere. Indeed, trying to find a ketchup without sugar is profoundly difficult. But we didn't always think sugar was bad. And again, I can very readily defend any of these things with science if called upon. Um, look at this. This was in 1955. This lady standing on a scale, <clears throat> hoping to lose weight. What? Eat candy and reduce? Reduce being the earlier term for weight loss. Yes, says the doctor. Here's why. Why is it hard to believe this doctor in his book of liquid sugar? Yeah, we used to think smoking was good too. <laughs> so it's not surprising that we once thought sugar was good. We're learning new things all the time. This one's a little more sobering. In a wonderful decade, good for music, bad for fashion. If sugar is so fatty, how come so many kids are thin? Boy. Imagine an advertisement like that nowadays. Uh, you couldn't do it. Um, but it just goes to show how much, how far we're coming in understanding where the real villains are. Now, I add this artificial sweeteners. You, you, you wouldn't, I mean, you want something sweet. Everybody wants something sweet from time to time. And if you are beginning to appreciate how insulin spiking sugar is, what are the alternatives? There are some alternatives. And this is a kind of a tricky. Um, topic in a way because it's a bit muddy water but the three sweeteners that I've found in any research that have no increase on insulin whether it's on their own or with a meal are these ones, xylitol or erythritol stevia because something like aspartame actually the patient alone taking aspartame there's mixed results it may increase insulin it may not but add that aspartame to a meal in other words that diet soda being consumed with whatever that mixed macronutrient meal is you are increasing the insulin effect of whatever that meal had been. And so it, again, it's muddy water. These are the three that consistently come up okay as having no insulin effect. And again, I make no money by promoting that. I'm not, I'm not affiliated with them at all. Now, what do, I, what do I mean by less starch? I'm not making a blanket accusation against carbohydrates, which is what fits in, of course, the family of starches. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying we have spent decades talking good and bad fats, when in reality, we maybe should have been at least adding to the conversation, if not replacing entirely, by talking good and bad carbohydrates. This is a phenomenally broad class of nutrients. And you can acknowledge that we've had our hand in it. We have been mucking around and changing things that were once very natural. For example, the wheat that we have now is indistinguishable from the wheat that prevailed 150 or 200 years ago. These are different plants, and it's very well established. This isn't controversial at all. What we have now, we call wheat, is so different from what wheat used to be that we call that spelt, or an even older one, which we call encorn. So we've mucked around when it comes to starches, just to plant that seed. When people see the natural plant-based diet, well, it depends on what it is. It might not be so natural. So how would I, based on data, lump some of the most prevalent carbohydrates? Sugar, of course, I'm solidly putting on the bad side based on data. Fruit juice, where would you think that's going to go? That is absolutely bad. This is a profoundly unnatural thing. Pure fructose without any fiber to come with it. Oh my goodness, we are doing our children and ourselves such a disservice. And indeed, you can have people with full-blown non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and all you do is have them stop drinking soda and fruit juice. And the liver clears up. And there's less, well, there's less um, hepatic fat. Now, what about a fruit smoothie? What's the difference between a fruit juice and a fruit smoothie? Yeah, the fruit smoothie has kept the fiber in, but we have just brutalized that fiber. If we were eating the whole apple, for example, that's profoundly different from having sheared the fiber so sufficiently that we can now drink it without any work. We have changed the fiber. So a fruit smoothie is not as good. As, as we like to think. So when my kids, when we're going to go out for a treat, they want Jamba Juice, I'll say, all right, you can have Jamba Juice or you can have a milkshake, because it's the same shite. 
<laughs> Almost. <laughs> can I not talk like that here? <laughs> I can talk like that at BYU. <laughs> not really, actually. Some of my former students are here. They probably know theirs. Good old Bickman. Getting irreverent again. And of course, this is well documented. Um, what about honey? Honey, actually, been, is, is really mixed. I'm not sure about honey yet. Um, there's evidence to suggest it's good and bad. In fact, the most consistent evidence is to show that raw and pasteurized honey is incredibly effective as a topical ointment. Well documented. I never would have imagined this. You, you have people with abrasions and test subjects, people with raw honey and people not. And the raw honey, will, it will increase the rate of healing by, by double, twofold increase. It's just remarkable. But honey, I'm not sure. I'm really not. It's nature's pure, it's nature's only source of, of natural sucrose in a way, insofar as it's pretty evenly split with sucrose, uh, with fructose and glucose. But I don't think it's an accident in nature that early man, we've mitigated this process by having our little honey farms, but once upon a time, if we wanted honey for ourselves or our families, we would have had to be prepared to undergo battle with these little <laughs> punks who were going to do their best to prevent us from getting their hard-earned honey. And so we would have gotten a little honey and run like the Dickens, and it would have been months before we tried that again. And so I say, let's treat honey now like we used to, with a great deal of respect for the little guys who made it. That's a little bit of an analogy, of course. Fruits and vegetables, eat them. Eat them. I'm not going to get into the fine points here. For the average type 2 diabetic, insulin-resistant individual, you can, depending on how severely diabetic they are, type 2 diabetic, you could, there's some more scrutiny that can go into this. In other words, the starchiest of the fruits and vegetables should, in fact, warrant some scrutiny. But just for the sake of time and ease, we'll leave them here. And then the grains, boy, this just depends. It depends on what the actual grain is, how refined they are, how we're eating them. I mean, oatmeal is a wide spectrum. Are we eating oatmeal from a little pack and it's a bunch of powder? Or is it the big, hearty steel cut oats that have to take 30 minutes to boil and then they're finally ready? It's the same plant, but they're very different responses once we actually get it in our mouths. And so this is a very, this one's delicate. And I appreciate, especially in Utah, with the predominantly LDS audience, um, this smacks of a heretic who's challenging the word of wisdom. If, if you are feeling that, let's talk later. And it's not, I believe, there's not as, quite as much to reconcile as you, initially, as you may think. All right, so the general conclusion with the patient hoping to mitigate the risk of prediabetes or reverse the prediabetes, just be mindful of the starchiest of the starches, these most common, bread, pasta, white rice, potatoes. Now I add this, get fermented. Uh, by that I mean, I think there's something to be said for eating foods the way we used to before refrigeration practices are what they are. Once upon a time, if you wanted your bread to rise, you would allow the natural yeast within that bread to ferment, to chew through the um, starches and create gas or CO2, and that would have resulted in the rising of the bread. We bypassed that with quick, act, quick, quick acting yeasts, but the same thing would be said of dairy. Before refrigeration, that dairy would have fermented and it would have been kefir or sour milk. When you have let a beneficial bacteria chew through some of the natural starches you are improving the insulin sensitivity. So this is something as obvious as eating sourdough bread. Yes, calorie for calorie, sourdough bread will have less of an insulin response than normal bread. Same thing with milk versus sour milk. And the same thing with adding other sources of these kind of versions of fermented foods like raw apple cider vinegar, which the data support. Eat a tablespoon in the morning with water, a tablespoon in the evening with water improves insulin sensitivity. It's such an easy thing to do. Now, increasing fat. Am I going way too fast, or is he so good? A little too fast? It's good. Okay. All right, now more fat. Let me defend this. You didn't have on your last slide. Where does chocolate go? <laughs> so if it's like the, the nowadays, thank heavens, with all these gourmet chocolates, we can really get to the good range, no question. If it's like an 80% dark chocolate and it's sweetened with something like stevia or erythritol, that's, you know what? You can really enjoy that. Um, fairly frequently. I mean, you can't go banana balls with it, but it'll be on the green side. What about nuts? Absolutely good. No question. And the fattiest of the nuts, the better. But remember, peanuts aren't nuts. Where are my former dietitians? Aaron, right? Okay. Peanuts are what, lentils or something else? They're not yeah. nuts, technically. And so when we talk nuts, uh, any nuts. study you've ever seen that talks about <laughs> nuts, they're talking about the walnuts, the pistachios, almonds, whatever, cashews, those are fatty. Yeah. I, I don't know. Seeds, yes, seeds are, many seeds are good too. 
anyway, those, those would be good. They're very fatty. And so that's actually in this range. So now increasing fat. Again, don't try to, don't crucify me. Let me defend this before you get upset. Because I appreciate that this challenges the most fundamental paradigms. Even still, the American Diabetes Association, of which I'm a member, implicates too much insulin resistance. And I would love to talk more about that another time. Um, it's just a matter of how we're actually looking at the data, uh, I, I believe. So more fat. Now, what's the relevance of fat? What happens? Let's look at what happens when we give a human strictly, individually, the three macronutrients. If you give a human pure protein, and in case it's just one type, we could have used whey here or any other pure proteins, this is the insulin response, where at around 90 minutes, you have what may be an increase of about three times over fasting insulin, so the change, 300%, so about a three-fold increase in insulin. So proteins will increase insulin. That's not bad. That's probably a good thing, insofar as the protein you're consumed Increasing insulin will help with the anabolic reactions anywhere, including muscles. So it's not a bad thing. But too much protein needs to be scrutinized. There was just a study published in a very good journal just over the past few weeks looking at putting people on a high-protein calorie-restricted diet. And they lost weight, but their insulin resistance didn't improve as much as the other people who lost a similar amount of weight. So protein is something that we can't go crazy with. And indeed, we should never be taking as protein powders. There's just no reason for that. If you're a bodybuilder and you want to get swole, you just need to eat more real food. Skip the powders. Don't drink shakes. Protein shakes. Not worth it. All right. Now, what happens if you give someone a pure carbohydrate? Of course, the response is much more dramatic, where you can get upwards you know, of a ten, over a 10-time increase in your insulin. Now, appreciate again, there's a tremendous spectrum of starches. If we were to put sugar or bread on here or potato, it would be even higher. If we were to put like broccoli, that's going to be much, much lower. And so when it comes to carbs, not all carbs are created equal, of course. There'll be a very different insulin response. But the average carbohydrate, like pure glucose, we're going to be around 10 to 15 times increase. Now, what happens if you gave a person pure lard? Which, mind you, we always look at lard as just this horrific thing. There's as much unsaturated fat in lard as there is saturated. If that pig, especially, has been um, pasture raised and allowed to eat something other than corn and wheat, which the pig wouldn't normally eat anyway, allow it to eat what it would normally eat, it has much more unsaturated fats in its fat than saturated, or than normal. So if you give someone pure lard, what's going to happen to their insulin? You can't even see it barely. There's no effect whatsoever. Dietary fat has no effect on insulin. Now, I appreciate how somewhat artificial that is. You could eat a pure carbohydrate in nature. You couldn't eat a pure protein, insofar as I know, Aaron, am I right or wrong? I think I'm right. You wouldn't eat pure fat in most cases. Typically in nature, you're going to get fat and protein together. So I appreciate that by strictly eliminating the protein aspect, we're kind of creating something that's a little artificial, but can still in our day be taken advantage of. When you're eating more pure fat, you can feed the body while keeping insulin low, and that has several benefits as we'll get into. So fruit and animal fats should be primary sources of, of dietary fat for the patient who wants to mitigate the risk of insulin resistance or reverse the trend. And what I don't have on here, vegetable oils, which are, we can talk more about. What's a, now, what's a fruit fat? A fruit fat, they're the three fatty fruits. Avocado. Avocados. Avocados, olives, coconuts. Those are fruits that are meant, early man, all we would have done would have squished it and we would have gotten the oil out of it. But get oil from canola or soybeans. Oh, no, no. The, the chemical process, the pressure, the heat that you have to have to get oil from a vegetable, that's a very new, that's a new kid on the block. And there's just not enough data out there yet for me to just blanket and throw that into the mix. We've been eating these for millennia. Early man, we cut our teeth on these things. We can handle them. Okay, this isn't as controversial as you think, lest some of you are still thinking of me as a heretic. I, even as a boy, remember this vividly on my grandparents' coffee table. What, unfortunately, has not gotten nearly as much press was this time cover. Eat butter. Scientists labeled fat the enemy, why they were wrong. This is really going mainstream. The idea that fat isn't the villain, and in fact probably never has been, is really becoming accepted more and more. So again, I'm not quite as crazy as it may seem. Indeed, the most recent dietary recommendations in the U.S. no longer restrict fat or cholesterol. They do place a limit on sugar. They still place a limit on saturated fat, which I won't get into now. But you'll notice that even though they're not saying a limit of fat like they used to, you know, no more than 30% of calories or something, they're still kind of going along the same old party lines, eating low fat or no fat. 
My goal in my home is for when my kids someday leave my home and go to college, I want them to be in a room, uh, in a place with their roommates, open up the fridge and say, what is low-fat yogurt? What is skim milk? No. In my home, we eat things the way God intended them to be eaten. Who am I to take fat out of milk if God put it there? <laughs> and so on and so forth. So we eat real food, and real food has fat, and that's okay. All right, so that's the end of the fat one. And again, we'll defend, we'll put some of these in context when we look at some disorders, if we have time. Intermittent fasting, just for the sake of time, um, I emphasize the intermittent nature. This is not the same as calorie restriction. It is not the same as every meal you leave the meal hungry. I just don't think that's a sustainable idea, to constantly be hungry. You are fighting fundamental urges in the body to eat. And so constantly telling a patient who has insulin resistance, oh, you need to lose weight. How do I lose weight, doctor? You need to eat less and exercise more. That doesn't work. It just doesn't work. If it worked, we, the problem would have ended right when it began. If it were that simple. It's not sustainable. So here's just one piece of evidence. Looking at, it put people, it made an attempt to put people at a 25% calorie restriction, either as a constant part of every meal of every day for this study period, six months, or allowing them to eat liberally for five days and then restricting calories for two days to get them to the same general 25% of calorie restriction week over week for six months. Now, mind you, in the end, this group actually ate more than this group. So the calories consumed in the intermittent fasting group was higher. Now, let's just look at these key, uh, key variables. Body weight was comparable. No statistically, no statistically significant difference. So we can't say there was a difference. Body fat over the six months was not uh, not statistically di uh, different either. Now when we get to waist circumference, we're getting really close. In fact, this one is even closer. We're getting to the 0 .05. So we know, we're starting to see that there is a trend for statistical difference, that the intermittent fasting group, the light blue, had a, a greater reduction in their waist circumference. And then lastly, when we look at changes in insulin sensitivity, now we have a significant departure. In fact, it's quite dramatic. Despite these error bars, it's still highly statistically significant in as little as three months and then much more noticeable as six months. So these, this group, by even eating more calories, by having a period of time that they were making sure their glucose came down to fasting and stayed fasting for a significant period of time, allowing insulin to come down to basal levels and stay low, that resulted in a significant improvement in their insulin sensitivity. So intermittent fasting in the context of prediabetes and insulin resistance is a relevant aspect and should at least be considered in the therapy insofar as the patient can perhaps eventually get to that point, especially as they wean themselves off of a high carbohydrate diet. Describe intermittent fasting. You think of fasting for 24 hours. Yeah, we do. And so so the way I interpret this, um, oh, so what, I'll talk about that. I'll have some recommendations in just a sec. This is a study to show that real severe calorie restriction or starvation diets causes insulin resistance. So the patient who has anorexia, for example, will have profound insulin resistance. But I won't get into that. So at its simplest, I at least recommend a 12-hour fast every night. So you eat dinner at 6, you don't eat anything again until 6 the next morning. There's, uh, there's some fascinating studies looking at neurological function where they do this to the patients. And it's just remarkable how they improve these early stage Alzheimer patients. And then uh, a couple times a week, skip, uh, skip breakfast. And then you, but again, you're eating full meals at every other meal. You're not going hog wild. You're eating until full and then you're done. Controlling the starch, avoiding the starchiest of the starches and being more liberal with fat. And thus calorie number has become far less important than calorie type. And then every so often, one or two times a month, the 24 hour food. And again, these are just food fasts. Food fast, food fast, not liquid, not water. So with these four pillars, I want to just look at some data that's looking at the effects of controlling starches and being more liberal with fat. And so in short, in essence, we're taking the trends that were once initiated by a government that maybe shouldn't have, um, and we're just reversing them. We're starting to flip them on their head, and we'll see what happens. So we'll look at four conditions insofar as time allows, and we really don't have so too much body fat is a problem. Body fat is a problem with too much insulin. This isn't a new idea whatsoever. The idea that various um, foods, particularly these starches, increase body fat more than other foods has been very well documented. In fact, type 1 diabetes is an excellent example. This is a woman type 1 diabetes. This is her thighs, her crotch, her knees are down here. What on earth is happening here? 
sites. Injection sites. She's a type 1 diabetic. These are not tumors. She's simply not been rotating her injection sites. This is a pretty dramatic example, and it's old. This one is more dramatic and not as old. This was published just last year in the journal uh, in JAMA. This they called in the UK belly bottom syndrome. He wasn't rotating his injection sites. So this is just proof of just how lipogenic insulin is. Indeed, it is impossible. I know of no single circumstance in human history where a patient can gain fat or become obese without insulin driving it. Think of it's a thyroid problem, cortisol problem, or any other um, steroid, non-inflammatory steroid. Whether it's a, a brain damage problem or a genetic origin, it always comes back to insulin. I actively try to find the exception. In 10 years, I've still not found one. It always comes back to insulin. Here's the first type of diabetic patient in the US to get insulin. Six months later, the profound difference, of course, is that she, in addition to having a lovely hairdo, now has gained some weight. And so two things happen typically when a type 1 diabetic begins treating with insulin. They start eating less, they have better appetite control, and they start gaining fat. This condition of a type 1 diabetic avoiding insulin shots to stay thin is very much a real eating disorder referred to as diabulimia. About 15% of all type 1 diabetics have it. What about type 2 diabetes? When you take a type 2 diabetic in a month zero, the beginning of their insulin therapy, let's look what happens. So you'll see at month zero from one to three to six, what's happening to their overall dose, required dose of insulin to maintain normal glycemia? It's increasing, that's not surprising, right? You can appreciate now that insulin causes insulin resistance. What's happening to body weight over the same period of time? From month zero in kilograms to month six, they've gained about 20 to 25 kilograms of pure fat. That's actually quite common. In a type 2 diabetic, they start insulin therapy, they will gain a significant amount of fat in fairly little time. What's perhaps the most relevant now is what happens to how much they're eating over the same period of time. If you look at their daily consumption, they're eating roughly 300 calories fewer per day at six months, and yet they're 25 pounds heavier. So every day that goes by, they're trying to fight this weight gain, but because the more and more insulin is creating more and more insulin resistance, and the insulin is promoting the growth of the fat cell, this isn't making a difference. It's not enough. So more, uh, a patient with patients with cancer, what typically happens to body weight in a cancer patient? Typically they lose weight, right? That syndrome of wasting, known as, known as cachexia. Now this isn't a universal trend, but it's common enough. In insulin secreting tumors of the pancreas, insulinomas, this study found that almost three quarters of them were gaining weight throughout the course of their cancer. Again, not a typical response when it comes to the cancer in the body. So with body fat, what happens if we make these changes? Here is a study, that, a randomized trial, of course, the gold standard. They put people on a low carb, uh, a low carb calorie unrestricted diet, so low carb, high fat, unrestricted access to calories, versus a calorie restricted low fat. So it's kind of the typical dogma when it comes to losing weight. And at, and at, at 24 weeks, which is fairly short term, and there are longer studies that we could go into, you see that the fat liberals starch controlled quite the she hoped for. <laughs> uh, it was, look at the difference. So several kilograms difference in body weight, even though this group is eating more calories than this group. So the calorie number was very different, but of course the calorie type was too. What qualifies as low carb? Uh, that's a great question. Um, there are a tremendous <coughs> range. There's a tremendous range. It could be simply putting it below the 50%, 60% norm, um, which many would say even other sort of scientists, especially in the nutrition realm, would balk that I would be even talking about lowering carbs below 50%. I am a big advocate, advocate at a minimum of going back to where we were before the food guidelines, at a minimum, which was a 40-40-20. That should be, in the case of insulin resistance, or someone who wants to avoid it and its consequences, a minimum macronutrient ratio, 40% fat, 40% carbs, 20% protein. But even in people who are more carb intolerant, you can really swing it even further where it gets to a 60% fat, a 60-20-20, or even a little further, and they have profound benefits. More studies looking at reductions in body fat by altering, more studies looking at these, a low carb or a low fat diet, body mass going down more, abdominal fat going down significantly more than um, with carb restriction as opposed to fat restriction. Now diabetes, sorry that I'm rushing now. Or in fact, let's just kind of skip this one. Di type 2 diabetes is a problem of insulin resistance. If you remove the insulin resistance, there is no type 2 diabetes. That is the fundamental cause of the disease. And so type 2 diabetes, I'll just show this study. 
due to the potent effect of carbohydrate restriction and decreasing blood glucose levels, we must reduce the insulin by 50% on the first day of dietary carbohydrate restriction to avoid hypoglycemia. As the weeks pass, most patients achieve normal glycemia without medication. Obese patients lose weight and patients save money because of the lack of need for medications. So this is an increasingly accepted, more data on dogma, that carb restriction needs to be a part of the dietary protocol for someone hoping to reduce the risk of insulin resistance or reverse it. Sulfonylureas, which are insulin secreted dogs, they were reduced or eliminated altogether. And the patients who couldn't get off their insulin were able to go down to 18 units per day, which is a pretty profoundly low number in an insulin-dependent diabetic. More data looking at the changes in glucose and insulin in an equation called HOMA. You'll see that all, even for the isocaloric diets, the high fat, low carb group, look at their drop in insulin. They had an almost 50% drop in insulin as opposed to about a 15% drop in the low fat group. Heart disease, this is the one that's a little, uh, uh, there's a lot to it. And when I appreciate that when I'm encouraging the consumption of fat, one of the most common responses is, well, then they'll die of heart disease. It's just not that simple. So insulin resistance is a key component to heart disease in any of its aspects, insofar as heart disease is quite an umbrella of, of cardiovascular disorders. And as you have the patient start changing their diet, eating more fat, controlling their starches, you'll see that the triglycerides drop by roughly 50% despite eating a high-fat diet compared to the low-fat diet. HDL goes up by roughly 10%. Very importantly, the triglyceride to HDL ratio, which is the poor man's method of determining the circumference and density of LDL particles. LDL itself is not, it's a terrible predictor of heart disease. If you can look at the subclass of LDL, what the actual diameter is, is it more type B or more type A or pattern B or pattern A, that becomes particularly uh, relevant in a predictive setting. So anyway, beneficial lipid changes in every condition um, when you're uh, in the context of heart disease by eating more fat. More data on that. And then cancer, of all of the topics, maybe this is the one that, uh, so the most common cancers are also prostate cancers and breast cancers. So the average breast tumor has six to seven times more insulin receptors on it than normal mammary tissue. Prostate cancers as well have been found to have an increased expression of insulin receptors. So they're responding to this growth signal <coughs> that insulin provides. And the most sen insulin sensitive men have the least risk of prostate cancer. The most insulin sensitive women have the less, the, the most reduced risk of breast cancer. So insulin resistance is relevant. Part of this could be due to this thing called the Warburg effect. Have you guys heard of this? Some of you. The Warburg effect is the phenomenon where we see that cancer cells love glucose. They don't want to use any other fuel to produce their ATP to fuel the growth if they don't have to. And so the problem with type 2 diabetes is that we have this perfect storm. We have too much insulin, which is an anabolic hormone telling the cancer cell to grow, and we're feeding that growth by providing it with a hyperglycemic environment. And that's maybe why there's such a connection between insulin resistance and diabetes and certain types of cancers. So here's some interesting studies. When you give someone an insulin secretagogue, like sulfonylureas, or actual insulin therapy itself, they have up to a 50% increased risk of developing cancer. Another study looking at sulfonylureas, again, a, a drug that increases insulin secretion from the pancreas, or just insulin itself, once again, we have a 30 to 90% increase in the incidence of cancer, or the risk of cancer. So what happens if you do this? For the sake of time, I'll just show this one study suggesting ketogenic is a term I haven't introduced. Just look at that as being synonymous with high fat, low carb. This is just indicating that this perhaps should be part of the therapy in addition to the well-established chemo and radiation. I'm in no way suggesting this is an effective replacement. I'm not that naive. But I am informed enough to believe that there should be some role for it in clinical practice. We've got, what, five minutes for questions? Not a lot, I'm sorry. All right, I'll be thrilled to answer any questions in any time we have left. So you kind of put insulin as the enemy, but what do you suggest for people with type 1 diabetes? Yeah. Not yeah, so the type that. 1 diabetic. The type 1 diabetic would want to incorporate the same dietary changes the type 2 diabetic would. There's something, in, in the end, the relevance is they just simply have to then give themselves less, less insulin based on what they're eating. If the type 1 diabetic eats a donut, they theoretically need the same amount of insulin that my pancreas would make to handle that glucose, but they're injecting it. And so, 
the relevance of this is highlighted in the fact that a type 1 diabetic can develop type 2 diabetes. Did you guys know that? It's a phenomenon referred to as double diabetes. If that type 1 diabetic is giving themselves a lot of insulin to handle the incredible amount of starches they're eating, they will become insulin resistant. And that, again, that's double diabetes. So they have this, the worst of both worlds. What else? Anything else? <coughs> yeah. Describe the glycemic index. We see that. Yeah, the glycemic index is, in fact, terrible. <laughs> the glycemic load is very valuable. Um, the, the difference between them, I hope, I hope I can explain it well. The glycemic index will take the type of starch that is in that food and assume a certain amount of it. Like, it'll take, assume 100 grams of starch from a watermelon and compare that to 100 grams of starch from a piece of bread. And the, both of them have very high glycemic indexes. But the glycemic load actually accounts for how much starch is in that food. There's actually very little starch in that watermelon. And so watermelon has a high glycemic index, which gives it a sort of falsely bad reputation because the actual amount of glucose you're getting from it is profoundly low. And so it has a very low glycemic load. Whereas bread, for example, or sugar, that has a high glycemic index and glycemic load. So a, glycemic, a low glycemic load diet, although I can appreciate the utility of glycemic index simply because it's so much better documented. We have GI numbers for almost everything. We don't quite have glycemic load numbers for everything. But insofar as a patient could and was able to let the glycemic load dictate their diet, then they'd be in great position, a great situation. But it gets a little complicated when you start mixing your nutrients together. You know, the glycemic load of a hamburger patty is nothing. The glycemic load of the bun is tremendous. When you put the two together, it's going to be somewhere in the middle. It just gets complicated. So just skip the bun and wrap it in lettuce. Plus the ketchup. Plus the ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> and the mayo. And whatever dressing they're putting on, it's loaded with sugar. And yeah, any effect on um, caffeine or other zempty not the lowest the room with things like that? Yeah, so caffeine has no known effect on insulin resistance. That's direct. You can infuse humans and animals with caffeine. They won't become insulin resistant. I don't think it's that simple, though. Caffeine increases the sensitivity to cortisol, so it enhances stress response. And insofar as that is an indicated, revealed phenomenon, it's hard for me not to think, if cortisol's up, insulin has to work harder. We haven't seen that connection yet, though, so I appreciate the danger of the scientists making that leap. That is a leap. I'm admitting it. But caffeine is known to increase the cortisol response. That the same dose of cortisol is eliciting an exaggerated response in the presence of caffeine. I am a huge opponent of caffeine personally. I don't think it should. I don't think it should be a part of our diet, as prevalent as it is. No question, it's an it's, It is an addictive drug, and we should treat it like that. Anything else? Did I just did I upset anyone by encouraging the consumption of fat? I hope I didn't. I didn't mean to offend. Simply inform. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thanks.